So you just missed me welcoming you, welcoming everybody and being very excited to be here. Uh, we have a great turnaround today. Uh, I'm Adi, I'm the Brand and Communication Manager here at Ever After. Uh, happy to welcome you all to our webinar, How to, want to Run QBRs in 2023. Uh, before we jump in, I want to remind you that uh, the webinar is recorded and we'll share the recording with everyone after. Um, we'll start with a short round, round of introduction, then Chacha will take over the mic as the moderator of this session. Um, feel free to shoot uh, the panelist questions at any time. We will try to answer most of them uh, during the end of the session. Some of them may be doing. Um, that's it. Let's start. So I'll start with you, Irit. Hi. Great to have you here. Uh, hey. I want to introduce yourself right away. Uh, my name is Irit Ezips. I've been in customer success mostly as a consultant since uh, 2013 been uh, participating in a lot of uh, thought leadership discussions online and otherwise. I have a YouTube channel you should always uh, check out, CSM Practice. And uh, of course, I do a lot of consulting work with uh, different companies on either optimizing or setting up their customer success program. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here. And hi, Jennifer. Uh, happy to have you here as well. Can you please uh, give a short introduction of yourself? Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jennifer Baca. I am a customer success leader at Zoom. I manage our North American enterprise team for one of the regions. So humbled to be here with Yuri. I actually look up to her. So really excited to do this with her. And QBRs is something that we're always talking about at Zoom and honestly at every company I've been at. So I'm just excited to be here. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here. And Shachal, who's also the moderator of this session, uh, would love for you to have a short introduction of yourself and take it away. Cool, thank you, Adi. So, so I'm Shachal, I'm MVP Product and Strategy here at Ever After. And uh, those of you who don't know us, uh, we provide, uh, we help B2B customer success organization uh, building customer portals throughout the customer cycle, uh, onboarding, ongoing high touch, low touch. And also we have a QBR uh, solution. Um, I'm uh, Before that, I, I was doing a lot of uh, sales operations role and revenue operations, so that's my, my passion. And I would like to jump in and, and ask, um, what is the main objective um, of a QB, QBR in your opinion? Let's start with, with that. Jennifer, you do those all the time. You start. I do. I, I, I feel like I do them in my sleep, and not only just with customers, I mean within my own internal team as well. Um, the main objective for QBR, in my opinion, is really are we delivering value for one, the customer, and even for me as a leader, am I delivering value to my CSMs? Am I meeting their goals? And then how are we measuring those goals? So that's really the main objective that I see. And then more goes into lower tier, more like additional levels, right? Like we elevating the partnerships that we have, we meeting objectives, and then are we really measuring the value with the products and services that we offer? Um, so I, I, I might say, you know, totally agree with you 100%. And I really like that you also brought up the fact that we should do QBRs that are internal, not just external. So that's a great topic to have one day, just, just about that. How do you do that? Um, with regards to QBRs for customers, um, for me personally, when I do those with my executives, the one thing I have in mind is what can I bring into that meeting that they can then take back and showcase progress, value, uh, business outcomes to their own executive team. So if I don't have enough uh, information there that they can share internally, I don't think I'm really doing my job. Um, the other aspect that I'm trying to always include in my QBRs is any risks that they should be aware of. We should always assume that these executives, while they have very clear vision for why they're investing in our solutions and offerings, they're always not always uh, fully um, aware of everything that's going on at the tactical level as we're working with uh, their people. And so I always surface up any kind of things that I hear or underlying um, barriers to success that they should be aware of with a very explicit call out 
to a risk mitigation strategy. Here's what I would have done, Mr. Executive, if I were in your shoes to just squash that barrier. Um, and so I think there's two, in other words, there's two types of values that you can bring. One is how are we progressing towards goals and what have we already achieved that you can celebrate internally? And B, how can you protect your vision and uh, squash barriers early? And here's my recommendation. Yeah, that, that's super interesting. I, I I wrote to myself a few topics that I'd like uh, to uh, discuss uh, uh, to do down in, in later in this discussion. I do want to start uh, after after we, we we align on the main objective of QBR. I would like to focus on what is not working maybe in current QBRs uh, programs. I I can give an example, uh, maybe like a, a story to tell. So when I was doing CS ops roles in my previous companies. Uh, so I was in charge of the QBR program, and it, it was a super strategic initiative. Everyone was on board. We, we had like an analyst that built us great dashboards so we can take sn uh, snapshots and put it in the slides. And then we had we tried to schedule uh, the meetings with, with the executive from both sides. And then the first, the first um, quarter it was a really, really good success. But then we started to see some drop in the number of QBRs that we have. And, and we found that that CSMs, it was hard for them to schedule. It was, I mean, there are many, many different reasons. And, and maybe if you can share some of your examples of what, what is currently not working in, in QBR programs. You want me to start or? Yeah, you can go first now, I read. <laughs> okay, I made a list. <laughs> <laughs> no, because you know, like I work with multiple companies every year, so I kind of get a sense of, you know, what are they all struggling with? So first of all, I want to say, when I used to do this exercise, okay, show me your QBR process, let's say five, six years ago, I've been doing this for about eight, nine years, versus now. Now when I kind of like, okay, show me your QBR templates, I'm sometimes blown away of how well done they are, okay? So I think a lot of teams actually get what a QBR should be about. So I'm, I'm just going to call that out. It's a good job community. We are making progress as, a, you know, in this profession. We know what it means. But I still feel like every now and then I get... Um, a slide deck that's, that might be a, like, a little bit too tactical, but it doesn't happen as much, as often as I used to see it because I think even customer success executives and CS ops, they actually give us the, the right template so that they we navigate navigate the conversation and the agenda is well structured. I think that's like number one that uh, what we should do. I think you touched on that point. We don't have a clear owner. Um, so in small companies, obviously it's the CSM, but what happens when uh, with bigger organizations where the account managers or the account executives actually only farm and hunt for a handful of accounts, are they the ones that are supposed to set up those QBRs or should the CSM be setting those up? Um, how do we make sure that the client understands what these QBRs are? Because if you've been in business for 20, 30 years, the customer is almost expecting you to talk about your support tickets. So how do you navigate that conversation? Do you even have a relationship with anybody that can tell you what those outcomes are? I can tell you that a lot of companies that have moved from being on-prem to SaaS have, have a tremendous issue talking to, for example, manufacturers about their business outcomes because they used to own the technology. They don't want to share their outcomes with you. So kind of like switching it with the customers is going to be a big deal. And those of you that work with customers that are in software companies, you don't have that issue. But when you go outside the software industry and you have customers from very traditional industries and incumbents and that, you're going to have some you know, barriers with your customers around wanting to share these type of stuff. Um, and then the last thing that I think is like a, a very big deal with QBRs is collecting the data and do it in a scalable manner, which I think is like the latter half of this webinar is just talk about how can you scale this thing? Because it takes hours to prepare, to schedule and all of that. Jennifer, what do you think? You hit so much. I mean, I'm sure my team is laughing as they're watching this if they're on here, but 
you know, a lot of the things we talk about, the first thing I noted here was expectation setting, right? Like you said, like first externally with the client, it's so different. I mean, even some of the tech companies that are very similar, I mean, we're talking like the Googles and Facebooks of the world, they view it differently. And a lot of it is driven by, if you're saying support tickets, utilization reports, and it falls flat, it falls flat, right? You're not able to elevate the relationships within that customer because the only folks looking at that, right, are the admins or the day-to-day -day contacts. The second thing I know around the expectation setting, like you said, right, is internally, like who owns what? So there's a lot of people, especially when we go into the enterprise space, you've got teams on teams, you've got overlay teams. How do you plan that effectively, right? And be able to really deliver value in a short amount of time. You've got C-level executives that are probably gonna drop off in the first few minutes or they're multitasking. So you really have to have a coordinated effort to make sure that in those minutes that you have the executive on the call, you're hitting everything on the, every nail on the head, right? I think the, the last two points that you said, right? But the roles and responsibilities, similar to expectation setting, like who does what? A lot of the QBRs lately that I've seen, they are very sales led or they have been because there's an opportunity on the table versus it just being, hey, we need to have a conversation with this client because we need to make sure that we're fostering the relationship, right? That we as CSMs are also farming, like we're identifying more organic opportunities. And the last bit really stakeholder alignment. How do I make sure if I'm going to have an executive on the calls that I pull an executive from our side as well so that we make sure that the attendance is there from both fronts? Jennifer, do you have an issue with like accounts that are also being uh, managed by a partner? That I find like that even adds like another layer of complexity. Like who should be scheduling that? Should they attend or not? Like should we attend or not? A hundred percent. I mean, being at Zoom, we've got partners on partners and it's so different. Each partner is not the same. And even right. it depends on the product, right? And so again, I think it's that alignment with stakeholders, expectation setting, and just being on the same page, right? To make sure that, hey, this is what how we're measuring, right? Product success, how we communicate internally, and then how we're going to deliver it to the client at the end of the day. But Sounds easy, right? But it's hard. It's really hard, especially even just scheduling alone, right? Especially if you're trying to get executives on a call, that could take months. And so and I know we'll probably go into like the different types of QBRs and the cadences that make sense based on the customer tier, but it's definitely something I'm seeing a lot. Yeah, and Shaha, I would say on a personal note, because sometimes I have to prepare and deliver those QBRs to my executives. I know the difference between a great QBR and an okay one. And it's yeah. really, you know, sometimes you're so busy and as a CSM, you know, you're thinking, gosh, I need to dedicate like three, four hours now to prepare like an excellent QBR. Do I have the time Do can I like, you know, cut some corners here and they would still get a lot of value. That, it's like the ultimate, you know, ethical dilemma of around, you know, bringing in 110% of, of everything that you have to each quarterly business review or just a business review if you're doing it once a year uh, versus, you know, cutting some corners and how, how can you scale that process if you can. I think those are like some of the dilemmas that CSMs often have. Um, I typically entertain three or four accounts. Can't even imagine if somebody has like 25 or, or whatever, like that's a lot, especially if you do it quarterly, that that could be a real challenge. And, and then I think that in many, many cases, like like I had, and then we had to, to revamp the process is that because it's, it's so hard to schedule, because it takes so much time to prepare, like tons of different screenshots and the, and the presentation and anything, you tend to choose only the high, the, the extremely high tier customers uh, and, and focus on them. And But then the question is what, what happens with all of the other customers? Could, could, wouldn't they benefit from such a, a such meeting or such a, a quarterly business review? Um, I do want to focus in two different areas. One would be how we can innovate in QBRs. And the second would be how we could actually scale QBRs preparation and, and uh, delivery. So let's start maybe with, with how we can innovate towards 2023 in our uh, QBRs. Um, 
Jennifer, can, can you start? And I also, there is another uh, question in the chat. Uh, what is a great QBR today? So I think that it, so today and in 2023, what is a great QBR? You know, I will say this, Zoom has taken a very innovative approach when it comes to QBRs. It's not your typical utilization metrics, looking at, you know, a joint success plan, goals, and then roadmap. There's this term that they use, and I didn't learn about it until I came here, and it's called art of the possible. And what they do is they really want to enhance the partnerships they have with clients. They're showing them what's coming. They want to have a VOC, type of voice of the customer conversation, right? And so it's more of a conversation versus tactical, like we've been talking about, right? That's how you're able to actually pull what are the goals? What are the goals we need to solve, right? What are your business needs that we can align the product to? Those have been the most impactful QBRs that I've seen. One of our CSMs here is great at it, where he didn't even get to the deck. Like the very first slide was just VOC, and he was able to pull so much from C-level executives. And now we know exactly what we need to measure for the product and for them to continue renewing with us and growing at the end of the day. A question for you, Jennifer. If you did that in every single QBR, can you really do that every quarter? No, and I think I'm it only like... works for the enterprise space. No, you're right. It works. <laughs> I, I wanted to say that sounds like an EBR. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that, and I, I think where we can scale it right is something we're we're looking at now too is you know customer spend, tier, vertical, product skews, complexity of products. And if we're able to really tailor templates, PowerPoints, emails, right, that content based on a certain criteria, that's what's going to help cut down the time, right, and see if it's really, and measure the value of it as well from the client yeah. side. I love that. Um, so I, I would say two things on top of that, because it's, it's so awesome that you shared that. And I do believe that there's a difference between an EBR and a QBR. And a lot of times for the very high level executives, you would only do a business review once a year. They just simply don't have time for that. Uh, so the QBR that I was sharing before, that would be like the person who is your executive sponsor, but you might also have a business review with a higher level even than that. So sometimes like someone that's like super um, uh, exceptionally, uh, uh, you know, um, higher up in the ranks. Um, for innovative purposes, I would say, um, one, uh, I've seen a lot of companies actually elevate the business review to actually have some sort of like an industry expert. So some of the larger companies not only bring in, you know, what should the roadmap be, but they are actually bringing in what are we seeing when we benchmark our different accounts in terms of the most innovative, best in class approach. And executives are always very, very interested in learning what other companies in their industry or that are, you know, trying to leverage that uh, area of the business are doing. So I would always um, encourage you to not only talk about that as a CSM, but actually make sure you bring someone that's an expert from your company to talk about that, because that really elevates the discussion. Um, and then, you know, in terms of follow up after the call, and I think Jennifer touched on that, I've seen some companies, you know, some of these business reviews are actually really well attended. You will have, I don't know, Jennifer, what's the largest that you had? I think from the largest that I've seen so far is I've seen around 25, and that was including, wow. now that was an EBR, I think around a QBR, maybe around like 10 at most, which is a lot, right, for a QBR. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, like, all right, you know, nine to 12, that's a lot of people. You might not have delivered value to all of them. And so what they've done is that they sent out a meeting survey after the call with just like two, three questions. You know, did it add value? If they said yes, you know, they gave them different options of what type of value they might have gotten. And then, you know, an area to add feedback as to, you know, how can we improve this meeting? What worked, what didn't, whatever. And so I think that's one way to always think about, you know, when you do value-based activities, not just business reviews, and you have a well-attended meeting to actually have that kind of follow-up. Nice. I, I do have a question um, that I think that uh, is interested. It is look from our audience. How would you differentiate QBRs or EBRs for high-touch and, and low-touch tiers? How can we differentiate EBR? Can you repeat that? 
Yeah, so so let's say that uh, Luke has a, a long tail of 60, uh, 6K customers. Should and how and if they should get a, a QBR versus like high touch customers? I think they should, um, but it won't look the same as a, a business review that you would do for a very large company, most likely, because when you have a lot, like I said, every... Every business review takes a really long time to prepare when you do it just, you know, once every while, not necessarily quarterly even. And so I, I've seen there's a, a bunch of tools out there now that will allow you to do QBRs in a much more agile manner. One of the, so I, I personally, like a, as a consulting uh, practice, have very large companies with very complex projects. And I also have a few that just, you know, do agile projects and it's a very small company. So for those, what I tend to do is on an ongoing basis, instead of waiting for this big business review, I actually have, I'm constantly tracking what are their outcomes, how, you know, how well are we progressing towards goals? What are the deliverables we've already made? Where are the risks? Who's engaged? Who's not? And then I record a Loom video and then send it to them. <laughs> and what happens a lot of times, so that's a very agile way to do so they're like a one-sided QBR, but they can comment on the Loom video, which by the way, they never do. What they do sometimes, what does sometimes happens after I send the Loom video, on my next call, they would ask to have an executive call with me because that Loom video triggered enough thought-provoking um, you know, aspects that they actually want to discuss more. And so it's a way to uh, create engagement and also sort of like recap, elevate the conversation to value-based um, discussions, et cetera. So uh, there's many ways to skin that cat, uh, but that's just one of the ways that I've seen how companies can potentially scale that motion of you know, elevating the conversation and creating awareness to value-driven uh, progress that we're having with customers. Yeah, I think just to echo that um, to Luke's question is, I think you have to start right with the segmentation of the customers. So you can have the same content based on either certain tiers or buckets, like we've been saying, right? Whether it's spend, product complexity, or maybe objectives, right? In the first place. And that's something we've done here at Zoom because we do have very large portfolios, even in the enterprise space. And if you're able to do that and then tailor it to those customers based on a criteria, it will help you scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great suggestion, actually, Jennifer. Yeah, I, I, there's like a bunch of ways. So, yeah, so the answer is yes, we should definitely do think about how we are doing business reviews for both segments. Um, but there's probably a different way to approach it depending on the on the segment. Shahal, do you think we answered that that question fully? I hope I, I, I will get my I will uh, have my take on that. I think that uh, we have many customers that definitely run QBRs with their customers, like with their high touch customers, and they prepare like the presentation with gathering all of the uh, data sources and, and putting it in, a, in like a slides mode. But we do see that, especially now with the tech slowdown, it, it becomes very critical to focus also on the long term, on the long term. But over there, you cannot really schedule a, a meeting with them. So by creating like an automated version with the data sources and all of that, this could be uh, sent to them as and as you said Eric, you could actually ask for feedback and then if they have anything that they would like to talk about they could actually even schedule their next call with you on a specific topic and then in in like a one-to-many approach you can create a dedicated personalized scalable uh, QBR so this is a, definitely a trend that we see many companies uh, um, going towards yeah I think there's two okay. Two, two big elephants in this room. One, how do we do it in a scalable manner? And uh, B, how do we do it even for the high touch in a manner that we constantly get engagement because we can't really do the same format again and again with the same team. They're just simply, it's not going to be super engaging. Um, so I, I would like to propose like we touch on both of those maybe before the end of the webinar because there's some uh, concept that there's only one way to do a business review. And I would like to really break that uh, contention because it's it's completely false. 
And Jennifer shakes her head. I, yes, I, she knows practically you can't have like the same agenda again and again with these executives. You actually have to steer the pot a little bit so that you can maybe meet with them two or three times a, a year versus just this once. Sometimes you don't even get to the agenda, right? And then it's like, how do I know? How do I know if I'm going to deliver delivering value? You didn't even touch on it. Yeah, so. exactly. Scary, scary thought. <laughs> I, I think that I, I think that's a great topic in terms of like the innovative part of the QBR. And I think that Jennifer, you mentioned before that it's not a presentation, it's a conversation. And I think that also the fact that one QBR doesn't have to be the same or shouldn't maybe be the same to the other QBR. The fact that we have like a successful dashboard, it doesn't mean that we have to reuse them because we will bore uh, the executive. We have to we have to we have to find the actual insights to them. And I think that if we will save the time on the preparation of like the, the, the technical preparation, we will focus on analyzing the insight, it will make it much more valuable for, for both sides. Exactly. Okay, let's see if we have a few more minutes and we have tons of different questions. That's that's really nice. Um, so would you recommend sending the the presentation prior? To the call is that like an it depends go ahead go ahead Irene. <laughs> is that like an it depends uh kind of question <laughs> kind of answer <laughs> yeah i was, I, I was I, gonna answer the same no sorry but it does depend right are we talking it, it really depends on the agenda for the meeting right if it's a standard QBR where it's more of making sure that we're meeting the same goals, we're looking at utilization, also giving them a glimpse of the roadmap, I think you could do a pre-read. But if you really are trying to target an audience and again, be able to identify more opportunities or maybe open a different type of conversation, it could also set the tone too early. Um, I've actually had this debate with my team. I know some of them send pre-reads, some of them don't. And it really depends on what you're trying, the agenda, or what's the goal out of the meeting. Yeah, if you, if your goal is to have a lot of open-ended questions and do more of a voice of a customer type of, you know, um, feedback collection type of meeting, there's no you're not going to have a lot of value detailed slides. If you have a lot of detailed slides, go ahead and send it. I can tell you this. Um, I've been setting uh, pre pre read uh, uh, <laughs> and I've been sending them using Docsend so I can actually tell whether they opened it or not. And only two percent actually opens them. And then out of the X number of slides, they only review two or three of them, or like maybe ten percent if I'm lucky. So uh, you want to send those slides? Go ahead and send them. The fact <laughs> the fact of the matter is, most of them will never will never take the time to pre read them anyway. So. <laughs> That's the truth. I think with another question question that is super interesting. Um, have you seen any different approach with like tools for developers? I, I can expand it like tool for IT departments, like tool for executives and decision makers that are less interested in maybe having like an actual conversation. So do you have any opinion on that? Well, personally, I, like I said, I think the Loom video is super engaging. Most of them will open it. That's my experience. Uh, no matter if it's like I'm sending it to the CEO or the GM, so long as my video is about five, eight minutes, they will watch it. And even if it's 12 minutes, they can always do it on, you know, X2 uh, speed and just get through it really quickly versus me wasting their half an hour because you can't have a meeting that's less than half an hour for some reason. So, sure. you know, um, here you go. I can just say everything I needed to say within a very short period of time and actually scale something that's a it's a high touch project. Um, so that's what I would have to say about that. Um, and I think, Shafar, you know, uh, Full disclosure, like I'm actually using Ever After to manage my customer projects and having all of these different sections already done in a format that I can just, you know, put it on a slide view and just when I'm recording those Loom videos already like have all the portions that I need already set and, and update them on an ongoing basis does help um, do these type of QBR conversations more often than waiting for three months and six months. I think one of the reasons we do those, like we do these big updates once every lots of months is because it takes us so much, you know, it takes so much effort to get everybody in the room and to, you know, schedule it and then prepare and coordinate all these. Yeah, sure. So you can't do that every two weeks, but what if you could just 
have all the information constantly updated and all you do is like a quick update then I think you get the engagement higher I think you can get them aware to risks and opportunities more frequently and honestly I, I the feedback that I received is that that was actually very valuable for them um, so something to think about you know can we just change our thinking and have a mind shift around mm -hmm. Do we absolutely need this big meetings or can we, in addition to that, just trickle out how we're thinking about value and how we're proving value? It doesn't have to be in a QBR. We can do it in a more agile manner. And also you, you, you said like basically like a self-service QBR would be option if, if it's hard to schedule with the, so, some app. Uh, it's Cousins. interesting you say that, Erie, because one of my clients, when I was still a CSM a few years ago, they did not like QBRs. If mm -hmm. you said that word, they were, said, we don't need that. We don't need to have that. <laughs> so we were innovative. We're like, let's call it a retrospective because they were developers. And so it wasn't QBR. It was just the jargon was aligned to the audience that was in the room. And so that worked for us. And it was, there were a lot of, you know, we got to know people were scrums. So we used some methodologies. Again, that is not entirely scalable across long tail, but at least if we're looking at those certain types of audiences, see what resonates with them. Like what will really get them to attend or even look at it in their own time, right? For doing some sort of a free read. Brilliant. That's, yeah, that's a great, that's a great uh, suggestion. Okay, we are, about to wrap things up, I do want to ask one last question. Um, what paradigm would you like to break around QBRs? If you have like one thing that, that people think about QBRs that maybe we should change their thoughts, what would it be? That they need to do it every Jennifer, time. would you like to start? <laughs> I, uh, I, would, I would love for, I know it's easier said than done, but I would love to be able to stick to strategy and not tickets not tactics it's it's really it's it's kind of a it's, a it's a slippery slope when you start that way and it's really hard to get out of it i know my teams are struggling with it because we deal with a lot of it we deal with a lot of developers and so it's hard and then it's really hard to be able to get to the right decision makers at the end of the day if you do want to go in that direction and so it's also where you see like the churn it's a surprise because you don't know about it. So those people aren't in the room that are the ones making the decisions. So if you can at least make sure to maybe have a type of QBR that is a bit more formal, right? To make sure you are on track for success and maybe try to have an appendix, right? Or on tickets. So make sure like if that is important to them, include it, right? At some point. But I, I just think, um, what was the, the term you used to share? It was uh, conversation, not a um, presentation. I like that. But of course, being scalable, right? Um, not always being able to do that, but I think avoiding the ticket territory. <laughs> cool. Yes. Amen to that. Um, and I have three things. One, um, you shouldn't have one type of QBR meeting. I remember, uh, I think it was seven years ago, Michael from the uh, Michael Blaisdell from the Customer Success Association told me, why are we still calling it a QBR? Like we're going to do it every quarter. We should call it something else. I was like, yeah, you're absolutely right. But, it, but, but it's already coined. So um, I want to know anybody that, you know, I think everybody agrees, you know, QBRs don't really need to happen every quarter. I would also challenge you to have three types of QBRs, like three different agendas and call them differently. Like actually do what Zoom does, which is, you know, can we adjust it to what customers are really interested in and have three different significant conversations with customers that are every time are tackling a different point of view so that it's interesting to the customer as well. I think you're gonna have a higher level of engagement. Um, in addition to that, um, I, you know, I had an interview on my channel with uh, Muhammad al Kak. He's actually on the call today. He's from Jordan. And I want to, he pointed out, you know, in order to have these QBRs, there's some things that we need to take care of first, which is really doing relation management. And so in that YouTube video, he's actually sharing his model and how he cultivates um, depth and breadth of relationships on a, a more consistent manner with these accounts so that we can avoid getting to the point where, oh my gosh, we need to do a QBR and we don't know, you know how to get that relationship going. I think it's something that we need to constantly work on. Um, 
And so uh, basically that's, those are my three points. Have more than one type of QBR, don't do them every quarter, um, and then really make sure you mitigate the risk of not having the right people in the room by cultivating the relation model in a proactive manner throughout the year. Question for you, Iri, because I see somebody ask this and it kind of goes back to what you're saying right now. What about an SBR, like a strategic business review versus calling it a QBR, right? Because that would essentially, because QBR essentially is just the cadence, right? It's quarterly. But an SBR being a strategic business review, right, might actually be able to reset the mind, right, of the audience. Sarah, what do you think? Exactly. I, I, I would say that a QBR should be the type of meeting. It, it should almost never be the actual title of the meeting, and so when I work with my clients, we actually set up three types of business reviews with customers, and we coin them in a way that makes sense and resonates to with them, right? So it could be, um, you know, like a workshop, you might call it a workshop instead of a QBR, um, and like point out what is the main topic of that um, discussion. And so we and we have to do it in a customer centric manner. Like what are the top things that customers really care about? So do we absolutely have to have a discussion around, you know, the strategy vision? Yes, so that's typically like an EBR. But then we also need to have a talk about what's happening with their vision for their existing business outcomes, the one we know about and that they really wanted to get out and like, how, what's the progress? How are we doing? Did anything change? Right. We need to have that discussion as well. And then maybe there's like a third one for the overall industry and like, how, where's the industry? Where's the benchmark? And so I think there actually is an opportunity to have this QBR positioned in various ways and then you plan them across the customer journey, especially for high touch. Okay, with that being said, I think that it's time to wrap things up. Uh, thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Rita. I think it was super interesting and insightful for all of our uh, participants in this uh, today's session. Uh, the recording will be sent. Um, we also prepare some kind of a QBR checklist that we will send uh, right after the, the, the webinar. I hope to see you again in our future webinars. And thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.